Hello and welcome everyone to the second series of the ASC Spend Seminar. Today we are presenting Thomas G. Singh, BD. Thomas is a Vice President of the Energy Farming Inc. He serves as the firm's National Village Practice Manager and provides oversight to numerous village design units throughout the U.S. and Canada. Mrs. Inc. has a wide range of experience in cooperating accelerated village construction concepts into various transportation projects. He is responsible for the development of ABC policy and guidelines manual for the New Jersey Turnpike Authority and assists with infrastructure and village construction, university transportation center, ABC UTC, and works as a member of the advisory committee for emerging ABC technologies. From his home office in Malta, New Jersey, Mr. Zink has acquired over 25 years of experience managing bridge design and rehabilitation projects of various sizes. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in both civil engineering and architectural engineering from Drexel University. Um, his family of five are lifelong residents of southern New Jersey. He and his family spend much of their time in New Jersey Shore, where they are fish, wakeboard, and relax on the beach. Thank you for sharing that with us, uh, Thomas. We appreciate it. Before I let you to begin, um, I do mention that um, the PBH hours will be, uh, the PBH this will be made available to all the participants. The completion of the seminar, which will be the end of next week. Um, if you have any questions, um, I will be looking at the chat function. So if you could use the chat function to post your question, and I will be able to moderate that and turn it over to Thomas. With that, let's go ahead and begin, Thomas. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Payman. Uh, good morning, everyone. On uh, behalf of Ghana Plumbing, I'd like to thank uh, ASCE for the opportunity to make this presentation today and hope this uh, presentation finds all the participants doing well under the circumstances. Really unique times, no doubt. Um, so the project that um, I'm going to be presenting today is uh, titled the Accelerated Superstructure Replacement of the uh, Route 139 Hoboken Viaduct. Uh, this project has a long history in design development, and it um, and it does provide a unique opportunity to compare a uh, conventionally staged uh, design concept to one that incorporated uh, accelerated bridge construction techniques and. Um, this is a very complex cut and cover structure located in a very highly urbanized area. Um, and I, I don't want to give the impression that this was done in a weekend or anything like that. It's not that kind of an accelerated bridge project, but, um, but there were some things that we did to incorporate um, uh, that, that thinking that, you know, perhaps a, um, uh, a, uh, impact on traffic a greater impact on traffic uh could you know greatly reduce the uh, uh the construction schedule and perhaps you know the the, the public would uh, be willing to deal with uh greater impact over a shorter duration than a uh, lesser impact over a much longer duration so that's um that, that's what i'm going to be presenting here today and um the presentation is going to follow the outline above here. So I'll give a little bit of uh, information on the um, background of the project and, and go over the location where it's at, some of the existing um, roadway features of the project vicinity, uh, some of the structural features uh, associated with the project, the purpose and need of why we undertook this project with uh, NJ DOT. And um, then I'll spend some time talking about the initial design concept uh, that was implemented um, uh, initially, and then eventually when the project was redesigned, how we incorporated uh, ABC methodology uh, to um, shorten the, uh, the the time frame of the project, and and then go over some of the relative advantages that the ABC concept uh, introduced to the project. So. Uh, Gannon Fleming's involvement with the uh, 139 rehab project goes back as far as uh, 1996. Uh, project design team consists of the owner, which is uh, New Jersey Department of Transportation. And the prime consultant for this contract was um, AECOM, who at the time when this initiated was uh, 
was actually with Jim Harris, who got acquired by AECOM. And uh, Gannon Fleming was a uh, major subconsultant to AECOM throughout the, the, um, the project. And there were actually two viaducts associated with the, uh, the contract. Uh, the, the viaduct that I'm going to be presenting today is the one that uh, Kat Fleming was responsible for. So uh, our role on this particular uh, structure was uh, to perform an inspection uh, of the existing structure uh, to compute uh, floor beam ratings uh, and perform preliminary and final design services for uh, structural uh, rehabilitation. Uh, we were also involved with uh, drainage design along the corridor and some drainage improvements. And we supported the project through construction by providing construction support services. <clears throat> a little bit about the uh, project location. You can see in the upper, upper right of the screen, the approximate location with respect to New Jersey and, and New York City. Uh, this project is just outside of uh, Manhattan and located in Jersey City. Uh, you can see that the Route 139 uh, project shown in yellow there uh, actually uh, splits uh, Hoboken from Jersey City. And it's located in a, um, you know, between two major um, uh, pieces of infrastructure in the area. To the, uh, to the east, you have the Holland Tunnel, which is the gateway into Manhattan. And directly to the west on uh, 139 is the Pulaski Skyway. Uh, so the 139 corridor is a is a vital link between the Holland Tunnel and the uh, New Jersey Turnpike, uh, which is just to the left of the screen here. So it's a pretty substantial corridor for for traffic movement. <clears throat> so the um, the structure that I'm going to be presenting that was originally constructed as part of the Route One extension. Uh, it was constructed in 1929, and it consists of a 3,200 linear foot cut and cover structure. Um, the express roadway, it's, it's uh, a stacked roadway basically, and so you've got uh, an express roadway below the structure, and you've got uh, a local roadway grid on top of the structure, and the, the structure shown in red here uh, is actually supporting the eastbound local traffic. Uh, on the structure itself, and the uh, westbound local traffic shown in yellow uh, on, on the top right here. Uh, this is the um, westbound local traffic is actually behind a retaining wall, an abutment wall that runs continuously along this, uh, this whole uh, stretch of, of structure. Um, there are eight cross streets that cross over the structure. Uh, and I'll, I'll be presenting each one. You know, I'll be presenting the uh, unique sections as part of this uh, presentation. I thought at this point it might be helpful for uh, getting oriented here. Here's a um, Google Earth view of uh, Manhattan. Uh, this is Jersey City and um, Hoboken in Hudson County, New Jersey. Uh, right here, you've got the um, Right around here, you've got the, the, the portal to the Holland Tunnel. And over here, you've got the um, Pulaski Skyway. And so Route 139 comes across here, and it's at this point right, right about here, where the, get the bearings here. It's this stretch right in here that we're talking about. The structure, the, the Western portal, Starts right here, and the uh, express lanes dip down under the local lanes, and the structure runs all along these cross streets until you reach the eastern portal here. So you can you get a, a better feel for it by just kind of zoom in on the top of the structure, or okay, the bottom of the structure. <laughs> you can see the uh, uh, there are two lanes of eastbound and westbound express roadway below the structure. Um, the portion of the bridge in shadow here uh, is actually supporting um, 
the eastbound upper roadway. Uh, the local westbound roadway is behind this uh, abutment wall up on fill and separating the two um, are, is a uh, open ventilator area just to get some ventilation into the, the structure. So you can see a little bit better here uh, what I'm talking about. The upper westbound roadway is behind this retaining wall, which serves as an abutment for all the floor beams that run across, and the upper eastbound roadway is on structure. So switching back to presentation here. Should the screens open, bear with me. <laughs> so um, so as I said, there were uh, the existing lane configuration, you got two lanes of uh, westbound and eastbound express on the lower roadway, uh, two lanes in each direction. And then on the structure, you've got uh, two lanes of eastbound local and on the retaining wall to the north would be the two lanes of westbound local with the open ventilators between. Some other, um, some other uh, features in the project area uh, that are worth mentioning is that uh, you've got some existing um, rail structures that uh, were on site. You've got the, uh, uh, what's called the Erie Railroad Cut uh, just to the south of the uh, viaduct structure and between the Erie Cut and the Hoboken Viaduct down a little bit lower into the earth you've got the Erie Railroad Tunnel and there's also another uh, tunnel that runs uh, just to the north of the viaduct uh, over here where the pointer is. So you can see that um, through this cross section you, you've got the, um, uh, the, the piece that carries the eastbound upper roadway uh, here supported by these floor beams, the upper westbound roadway, and these are local streets. So we've got buildings in close proximity uh, to the north of the structure as well. So a number of existing rock slopes in the area, and there were also a number of parking areas that had to be um, dealt with uh, being in an urban setting. Taking a look at the um, the western uh, section of the project, you've got um, because the because the uh, express roadway dips down and goes below the viaduct, uh, the high skew angle at the western portal requires a uh, portal truss on the west end, uh, which is. Um, if I were to go back to uh, Google Earth, you can get a better view of it here. So where the lower roadway dips down under the local roadway, have a large truss that has to span across there because there's no place to put columns uh, in this location to, to catch the floor beams that would normally go uh, in this area here. And I had mentioned that this project included two viaduct structures. You can see there's a structure right here, just to the west of the Hoboken Viaduct uh, that carries 139 over um, some railroad tracks. That was the uh, viaduct that uh, ACOM was responsible for as part of this project. And uh, if we, Zoom in a little bit here, we might be able to see a ground level view of what that portal looks like on the western side. But for the most part, uh, with the exception of the western portal, for the most part, the uh, typical section, which, um, which would be where the cursor is now, typically they were uh, floor beam spaced at every 20 feet or so uh, along the length of the structure uh, with deck supporting the upper eastbound roadway for about maybe two thirds of the length of the floor beams with the other third uh, open for ventilation for the roadway below. That's the, the vast majority of the structure is configured that way. Um, there are some 
variations of that at all the cross streets, where the cross streets um, cross at, at various angles, the floor beams actually uh, are skewed to, to run parallel with the cross streets, and they function more or less like a, a typical multi-girder um, bridge, uh, per se, as opposed to a floor beam stringer configuration. <clears throat> so, uh, the existing structural um, features, uh, the superstructure, it was 185 spans um, with eight cross streets. So, the 185 spans were basically the spans between floor beams uh, and then you had the additional floor beams that made up the eight cross streets, uh, uh, the, the, the eight multi-girder bridges at the cross streets. So uh, the deck was uh, concrete and consisted of and, and included um, some open balustrades. Um, the floor beams and the floor beams were built up uh, steel sections that were riveted, and everything was encased in concrete. Um, and the open ventilation areas, as you can see in the lower right photo, um, they were originally just simply open, um, just fully exposed, uh, and, and the DOT was having all kinds of problems with uh, these ventilation areas for uh, debris and, and vandals throwing things over the <laughs> over the parapets down to the roadway below just to cause a little chaos. So they, they ended up stringing uh, some some uh, uh, wire mesh, some fencing fabric basically uh, over the uh, exposed part of the floor beams and they became a ma maintenance issue for DOT to get out there and clean them up every now and then. But you can see the condition of the structure, it was um, in pretty poor condition and in need of rehab. Uh, looking at the typical section, once again, you'll see in this, um, in, in red, highlighted in red here, that there was a concrete gravity wall abutment that ran the entire length of the structure uh, along the north side of the structure, and that supported all the, um, the floor beams that, uh, that, that, that ran perpendicular to the express roadway below. And Along the east, uh, I'm sorry, along the south side of the structure, highlighted in red, uh, for the most part, the floor beams were supported by individual uh, concrete columns. Uh, that, that's the typical section was uh, uh, concrete columns supporting the, the, the south end of the floor beams. Although that would change, of course, at the location of the cross streets where the columns would be replaced by abutments to hold back the fill. Uh, in the approach roadways, but for the most part, the vast majority of the floor beams are supported by individual columns. As far as the purpose and need, uh, the uh, project, the, the purpose of the project was to eliminate the structural deficiencies uh, to ensure that the um, uh, continued structural and operational integrity of the, vi of the you know, viaduct could be maintained. So um, improvements included the replacement of the concrete deck and the concrete encased stringers that ran between the floor beams. And uh, live load capacity improvements of the floor beams would uh, come from the reduction of dead load from the encasement removal, uh, as well as incorporating lighter uh, deck systems and um, Uh, and, and there was also some floor beam strengthening that was part of the, the original design. So, so basically, um, the, the deck had to be replaced. The stringers, it, it was felt that the stringers would be best to be replaced uh, with new lighter stringers and then uh, maintain the existing floor beams, but just remove the uh, encasements and then uh, strip the, the, the steel, you know, repaint them, repair them, and uh, strengthen them if need be. So I'm getting a, a little bit ahead of myself here, but the um, so the initial design concept, the final design was initiated in 2002, uh, and as I mentioned, we would remove the encasements, clean and paint the floor beams, 
strengthen them if required, but it also included the installation of some metal grating over the open ventilation areas in order to uh, eliminate the chain link fencing that was used to catch the debris. Um, we would also uh, replace the deck and stringers and the, the intent was to repair the abutments, repair the columns and repair the bearings. So that was the original scope uh, of the project. And the staging that was associated with uh, this original concept maintained all four upper lanes at all times. Um, so right now you can see in this upper uh, cross section, the upper eastbound lanes are typically on deck while the upper westbound or behind the abutment uh, on, on fill. Um, however, in order to maintain two lanes at all times within the confines of the, the project site, it would mean that a lane or two would be on the structure at all times uh, throughout construction. And that was what the original design called for so that we didn't impact uh, traffic operations or did decrease the number of lanes available um, in the local street system. So what that meant was the steel grids that were being placed over the open ventilation areas would have to be designed for truck traffic. Uh, as you can see in this lower section, uh, you know, a lane and a half of, of temporary lane would be riding on the floor beams. And because there was concern about having uh, vehicles riding on open grids directly over uh, the lower westbound roadway uh, for the entire length of the structure. Uh, there was concern about traffic debris falling down onto the roadway below through the grids. And so a netting system had to be uh, included in the original design to catch any debris that would fall through the, the open grids. So, uh, of course, if you're maintaining traffic in this configuration, uh, although it would allow the deck and stringers to be replaced, it made it virtually impossible to replace the floor beams. And so that is primarily the reason why the floor beams were being retained under the original design and just being cleaned up and, and rehabilitated. So um, in 2007, the original design got to a point where it was about 95% complete. They were just dotting I's and crossing T's and getting ready to make the final submission when construction funding came to a, um, it, uh, became an issue on the project. The, the DOT just didn't have the funding necessary to, to move ahead with this project. And so the project got shelved uh, for a while. Um, and uh, it was during the shutdown period where uh, we had approached um, some some uh, people from NJ Dot and said, you know, maybe there's a better way to do this. Uh, I know we've invested a lot of time and effort uh, in in uh, you know coming up with the rehab plans, and we got real close to being done. But uh, if if there's any way that we can find to get these lanes off the structure, um, if you would give us that leeway, I think we could get a a much better. Uh, final solution implemented. And um, the, the idea was if we can just find a way to get to detour two of the lanes off site, then maybe we could replace the floor beams instead of trying to rehabilitate them piece by piece. And keep in mind that if we were gonna rehabilitate these floor beams, we'd have to do it in 12 foot sections as we walk across the lower roadway so that we can maintain as many of the lanes below as we can. So you would have a lane closure on the lower roadway um, and working in that those confines, you would have to strip the paint off of 180 some floor beams, repaint them, uh, repair them, possibly even strengthen uh, portions of the floor beams all in 12 foot sections. So it was a real complex uh, undertaking if we could find a way to get traffic off the structure and just simply pull the old floor beams out and put new ones in, we felt that there might be substantial time and, and, and cost savings in doing that. So the DOT liked the thought and, and therefore uh, implemented what was called a smart solutions workshop, which is basically a, um, 
you know, basically a, a value engineering uh, session in uh, 2008, which included uh, folks from Dana Fleming, AECOM, and the DOTs, various bureaus and divisions. And uh, what came out of that study was that uh, if we were to build a temporary roadway at the east end of the structure, which is currently um, a rock cut in part and uh, an existing parking lot in part, if we were to build a temporary roadway at the east end, then it may be possible to divert the eastbound uh, traffic on the structure th through the city grid through, um, and, and, and get them off the structure so that we could replace the floor beams. And the, the initial numbers show that we could save about 12 months of construction and about $30 million uh, in cost uh, by eliminating that uh, staged rehab of the floor beams. It would also provide a safer work zone for the, um, the contractor and would certainly simplify fit up of, of steel components. Just keep in mind, we were going to replace all the stringers between the existing floor beams. And so the fit up was an issue. We were not quite sure what we were going to unearth when we started to take off encasements from these, these beams. So I want to take a just a, a quick aside here to talk about accelerated bridge construction. Like I said, this isn't exactly a, uh, um, a, a, a um, real uh, real crunch schedule, but we, we did feel that we could save um, uh, up to a year in construction time with this, um, with this solution. So a little bit about how accelerated bridge construction projects are measured. So um, some of the metrics that FHWA defines for accelerated bridge construction includes on-site construction time. Uh, on-site construction time, which is represented by the, the full length of this bar at the bottom, is the total time that a bridge site is uh, altered by a contractor from the time they occupy the site to the time they're cleaning up and leaving. That's, the, uh, that's defined as the on-site construction time. And mobility impact time is a subset of uh, on-site construction time. And that's a period of time where uh, traffic flow is restricted by construction operations. Okay. And that's uh, mobility impact time. So, um, FHWA defines several tiers of um, ABC, uh, tier one being the most um, significant uh, or, or the most, uh, the shortest duration, let's say. That, that is a, a project that can uh, reduce MIT to within 24 hours. So that's like an overnight replacement of a structure using a, a roll-in type uh, uh, solution or a slide-in or something like that. Uh, tier two reduces MIT to within three days, so that's basically a long weekend. Tier three uh, reduces MIT to a um, period of two weeks or less, um, uh, and tier four uh, is extended to you know, a three-month period or less. However, they also define uh, another type of ABC, uh, which is tier five, where your overall MIT might still exceed three months, but your overall on-site construction time can, might be able to be reduced by implementing uh, innovation. And that's basically where this project falls uh, as a tier five ABC project. So on this slide, what I'm showing here, again, the red represents the eastbound local uh, roadway that's supported on structure um, from the east end to the west end. And the yellow above it is the uh, westbound local traffic on, behind the abutment. And the green sliver between the yellow and the red is the open ventilation areas. So the idea behind uh, the redesign concept took advantage of the fact that the Hoboken Viaduct kind of crosses the city grid uh, at an angle. It's, it's, it's skewed to the city grid, and you, as evident by the angle that all the cross streets cross the viaduct. Um, and and um, what, we, what we felt was if, is if in this section right in here, at the east end of the structure, if we were to build a temporary roadway next to the 
structure, which currently right now was half parking lot and half open cut uh, rock slope. If we were to build a temporary roadway uh, between Baldwin and Palisades Avenue, then we might be able to divert traffic in sections around the site, uh, taking advantage of the triangular uh, detours uh, that the uh, city grid provides. So phase one would include doing some rehab of the substructure units, but when we got to phase two, uh, I'm sorry, phase one included rehab of the um, uh, substructure, but it also included the, the, the develop the um, installation of this temporary roadway. Then in phase two, what we could do is we could take that, um, that upper eastbound traffic, which is shown on orange here on this graphic, and divert them down central and down onto this temporary roadway where they can pick back up where they left off and get to the Holland Tunnel. And that would allow us to replace this portion of structure in red without any traffic on the, on the structure at all. Um, once phase two was complete, we would then just make the detour a little bit wider. Um, again, taking traffic off at Summit Avenue this time and getting them back onto the temporary roadway. And that would open up another stretch of the structure um, to allow it to be replaced in full. And then finally, uh, in phase four, we would divert traffic down JFK Boulevard uh, and, and then again back onto this temporary roadway to the east. And that would allow us to uh, replace the Western Portal Truss and, and the portion from, from uh, the portal to Summit Avenue. And the nice part about this, um, this concept is that, uh, and if I were to, if I can go back, the nice part about this concept was that we figured that the, um, the, 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 the contractor would, would gain some efficiencies as they gain more experience um, from phase to phase. So with phase two construction, the detour was relatively inert. Uh, it was you know, a, a small bypass around the parking lot uh, starting at Central Avenue and continuing to Palisades. It was a pretty small detour. And so if this stage took a little bit longer than expected uh, due to the learning curve, at least it wasn't a huge impact on traffic. But the thought was by the time they got to phase, phase three and the detour was a little bit longer, that the contractor would have been gaining momentum. And hope, you know, the thought was that that stage could be done much quicker. And of course, the hardest part of the job was the replacement of the truss at the western end. And by the time uh, traffic had gotten used to this concept of getting off of 139 to get back on um, down the road, uh, there'd be um, there'd be acceptance from the public on the job, and on top of that, the contractor will have really gained his stride, and um, you know we the, the intent was to minimize the phase of these constructions as we as we went. So in um, 2012, the design of the project picked up again. Uh, the, the, the DOT really liked the concept. Uh, they sold it to Jersey City uh, officials and everyone seemed to be on board. Uh, there was still a funding issue with the project, but in 2012, um, there was some uh, money for a tunnel project uh, connecting um, uh, New Jersey to uh, Lower Manhattan with um, uh, a, a tunnel project, a gateway tunnel project that uh, Governor Christie had um, uh, utilized some funds when that job got squashed. He, re he uh, diverted some of the funds from that project to the Pulaski, Sky Hab, uh, Pulaski Skyway Rehabilitation Project, which you can see here. And that was a real boost for our project because uh, the DOT's thinking was, well, there's you know, we're investing all this money in the Pulaski Skyway. We really need to have the entire 139 uh, roadway up to speed. So they decided to include the Hoboken Viaduct as part of the Pulaski Skyway rehabilitation and, and called it uh, contract number two. So basically the design and construction funding was provided by the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey with the uh, diverted uh, tunnel funding. 
cursor. There we go. So, um, as I said in the beginning, uh, the the fact that we we looked at two completely near completely uh, designed uh, alternatives, one utilizing a more conventional uh, construction staging scheme, maintaining all lanes of traffic on top at all times, versus this new concept, which basically meant okay, we're going to inconvenience the traffic a little bit and implement some detours, but, but we're going to do that in the interest of saving time and, and in the end, uh, save some money as well. Um, it gives us the opportunity to, to, to really compare a conventionally staged concept to uh, what we were considering as a Tier 5 ABC concept. So some of the advantages that this uh, new redesign concept provided was, uh, number one, all lanes were taken off the structure uh, when the structure was being uh, replaced uh, in, in pieces. And that just made for an overall safer condition, uh, both for traffic and for the construction workers, and gave the contractor plenty of room to work. Um, you know, and as you can see, they, 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 it would have been very difficult uh, for them to find the room to place their cranes to, to, to do the work that they needed to do under a deck and stringer replacement. So this really helped them out by providing them with a decent amount of work area and staging lay down areas. Uh, this graphic, I think, really summarizes the, 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 the advantages pretty well. Uh, you can see here uh, that um, the floor beams were all now replaced with brand new floor beams as opposed to trying to rehabilitate the floor beam that you see on the right there. You know, once encasement started coming off, you, you, you never know what you're going to find. And uh, there's inevitably going to be project delays when they start finding uh, uh, damage that, that was not able to be seen through the, uh, through the uh, encasements. So trying to save those floor beams on the right versus the ability to replace the floor beams uh, as shown on the left, where that was uh, probably the biggest advantage of the whole thing is that the whole superstructure was now on the same, uh, same future lifespan, basically. So not only did you uh, get the new floor beams, but just like the original design, you would get new stringers and, and a new deck. But also since the floor beams were coming off, it gave the opportunity to uh, reconsider what we're doing with the bearings and the columns. Um, so there was so much construction, there was so much savings that came out of this new concept um of replacing the floor beams as opposed to rehabilitating them that the dot felt that it would be best to reinvest some of that savings back into the structure and replace the uh columns that um run along the southern side of the structure and there's nothing that you can really do to replace the abutment on the north side without major impact to the the city street grid and and local buildings so we were always going to plan to reuse the abutments on the north side of the structure, but these columns on the east, on the south side, uh, now that the floor beams have been removed, now we can consider maybe even replacing those. Um, and in fact, uh, instead of trying to clean and uh, fix the existing bearings, uh, we ended up putting new neoprene bearings on, on both the abutments and the columns. Another advantage, this was, um, Somewhat of a lighter, uh, somewhat of a, um, a lesser advantage, but still an advantage nonetheless. Uh, the grading that was uh, going to be placed over the um, open ventilation areas could now be lighter than what they were originally going to be designed for under the original concept, because they would no longer need to support uh, truck traffic during construction. They're simply there to uh, catch debris or uh, the occasional pedestrian that might hop a parapet and, and run across it, but, uh, but, but at no point will they ever take um, vehicular load. So they could be designed with a, a substantial cost savings. And, um, and because there were, was no uh, active traffic on the, um, the crates, we could also eliminate the debris netting uh, that we originally proposed to prevent uh, stones and, and whatnot aggregate from dropping down onto the roadway below. 
Uh, one of the challenges on the project um, was the, uh, at the cross streets where uh, in the original design, there were several uh, utility bays where the utilities were actually buried in soil uh, between the stringers. So basically there was a, uh, in addition to the deck slab on top, there was also a slab that ran between the lower flanges of the, uh, of the floor beams. And at the cross streets, the floor beams are basically just regular girders. But um, uh, that bottom slab would, would support uh, soil. And in, within the soil were, were various utilities, water mains, gas mains, and stuff. Um, so one of the advantages is that we would eliminate these um, buried conditions and make everything um, um, supported on, on suspenders, which would make uh, future maintenance a whole lot easier uh, by making utilities accessible. But it did prevent, it, it, I'm sorry, it did um, it did present uh, a, a bit of a challenge during the, the staging because if, uh, if the existing floor beams are to be removed and the existing floor beams are actually supporting the utilities, we had to devise a way to bypass the utilities uh, during construction. As you can see here, we, um, uh, in the uh, upper right photograph, we had to uh, develop some temporary beams that uh, spanned over the roadway uh, that allowed us to put some temporary utilities um, on, the, on the temporary overhead structure while the existing floor beams were removed. So one of the other advantages of uh, this new staging scheme was the, um, it allowed us to utilize prefabricated superstructure modules consisting of uh, two stringers. Again, these were about 20 foot spans between the floor beams. There'd be uh, two 20 foot long stringer, steel stringers with prefabricated um, uh, concrete deck slabs uh, on top of them. And then we would place these units between the new floor beams and then stitch them together with um, closure pores. So that was not an option in the original design, uh, even though the goal was to replace the stringers and the, and the deck, uh, the precision required to use this kind of system is not very compatible with um, a, a rehab of the existing floor beams. Uh, you know, once the encasements come off and you find out where all the, uh, stiffener plates are and where all the holes in the steel are, uh, the connections are, 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 are likely to be more problematic um, trying to do this with a, an existing floor beam. But the fact that we replaced the floor beams in full gave us the ability to use these prefabricated modules, which for vast sections of the viaduct, that was a, a viable solution. And these things went in very quickly and, and, and very cleanly. Uh, and that was in part due to the predictable fit up. Uh, as you can see, this is a photograph of one of the floor beams that um, uh, was um, exposed after the encasements were taken off. And these are the kind of challenges of trying to use um, prefabricated modules in combination with existing, uh, existing floor beams. So uh, as with all, all prefabricated systems, uh, it's very important to, to do um, fit up in advance to make sure everything fits in the shop before you bring it out to the site. And the fact that we were replacing the floor beams allowed us to do just that. We were able to do a lot of shop fit up prior to bringing everything out in the field. And we avoided situations such as this where um, you know, it might've been difficult to make those connections. And of course, reduced life cycle costs, uh, you know, the entire superstructure being replaced and the columns being replaced, uh, it, it really reset the clock on the structure and, and, and gave it a, a much longer life cycle. So we do have a question uh, from Nikhil. Yes. He's asking what are the $30 million saving in ABC account for the lost road user cost while in Detroit? Uh, we, it did not factor in road user costs, but then again, 
we don't believe that there was really any significant impact to road user costs only because we did maintain the two lanes of, of traffic. They just went down side streets. Uh, so they, they, they maybe went a couple blocks out of their way, but it wasn't a complete shutdown of the upper eastbound roadway. But no, the, the costs that we're talking about are strictly the structural costs and not the soft costs. And, and, and in fact, um, you know, the, the, the original rehab, and that's what the slide is showing now, the, the original rehab uh, estimate was $97 million to replace the stringers and the, and the deck and rehab the, the floor beams. Uh, our estimate for the redesign, again, just with excluding soft costs, were um, just under 70 million. And the contractor actually bid the project at 62 million. Um, so it was a pretty substantial uh, savings, about 30 um, when, when all is said when, when all is said and done. So Shavoni Construction Company out of Secaucus, New Jersey, was awarded the contract. And they did a fantastic job uh, with all the challenges that were out there. Um, as I said, you know, when you're doing these complex rehabs, there's, you're bound to unearth some things that you just didn't anticipate. And sure enough, there were things like that associated with the abutments and the uh, columns. But uh, for the most part, they did a great job with, uh, you know, um, uh, addressing the problem in a timely fashion. So. That that concludes my presentation. Um, you know, and I, I think it's an interesting side-by-side uh, -side comparison between conventional and I guess you could consider this an ABC project. I mean, every time I, I make this, I've made this presentation a couple of times and everyone's like, oh, you did that in a weekend? Uh, no, not quite, not quite a weekend. <laughs> but it, uh, it was a four-year, initially it was supposed to be a four-year project and, it, and the project was cut down the three years. And, and so, um, you know, e even though traffic had to use local streets uh, as part of these detours, it seemed like an inconvenience, but at, at the same time, it, it, if it cuts an entire year of, um, of impacts off, uh, you know, people were, you know, we received very few, very few complaints about it from the public. So in, in general, I think it was, uh, it was a successful implementation of, of a, a rethinking of, of how you stage a project to, to, to better serve the public. So again, I thank everyone for um, you know, participating today. And, and at this point, if anyone has any further questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thomas, I do see a question. Um, it says, was there any concern with the cold joints created from the closure ports and how were they sealed? We did not use we did not use any unique materials for the closure pores because we we felt that um, you know like for example we didn't use ultra high performance concrete we didn't feel the need for the added cost because there was just not a benefit to the schedule to do so so we we used conventional concrete um, uh, for those um, closure pores and the surfaces were. Uh, roughened and and, and um, uh, you know coated before the concrete was placed, and uh, you know we didn't see any, we didn't really have any problems with the closure pores uh, opening up or anything. Now that might have been a little bit different had we used some other type of material, but um, material we used was very compatible with the base concrete, and we didn't have any problems. Awesome. So I'm asking Brooks if they are able to unmute the participants. That way, if there are any questions, they can directly just ask you. Um, I do another, I see another question on the chat here. It says, what effect did the overhead work have on the lower level of traffic? So the, so the, the, uh, the girders that were placed uh, obviously required the lower roadway to be shut down while the girt, while the floor beams were being replaced. So they, that was done at night uh, under uh, short-term closures, uh, just with um, you know uh, police just temporarily closing the, the the road down while they swung the beam into place and set it. Uh, so they went pretty quickly, and, and and at the time of night that they did it, they didn't have very significant 
economic impacts. Um, we did have a movable barrier between the lower eastbound and westbound roadways, which allowed us to reduce a lane uh, off-peak um, under, under the structure at times, which gave the contractor a little bit more work space underneath when doing the rehab of the abutments and when placing the columns. And uh, that, that movable barrier was just uh, shifted based on the peak flows of the traffic. Yeah, everyone should be unmuted if you have a question. Okay, another question is any safety concerns and recommendations on construction? Uh, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, any safety concerns and recommendation on construction? Any safety concerns? Um, I, I, no, I, I mean, I think, um, I think the use of the prefabricated uh, modules really helped with safety. I mean, it really reduced the number of field personnel out at the site um, for the most part. I mean, there still were some sections that had to be cast conventionally. All, all of the, all eight of the side streets had to be done in a very conventional manner because of the high skews and the utilities associated at those locations. But, um, and that was like eight small bridge replacement projects, you know, as part of the, the overall project. But in between those areas where the prefabricated units could be used, uh, I think those went smooth with very few people at the site. Uh, with very few fit up problems because of the ability to shop fit them. Uh, so safety wise, I think uh, it, it went pretty smooth. Um, if, if anything, drainage was a bit of an issue um, only because some of the drainage that was on the lower roadway to start had some uh, functionality problems to begin with. And um, we did get some ponding uh, through the, the the site, which we addressed during construction phase services. We, we came up with some uh, drainage improvements to help resolve that. But other than that, I, I'd say it was a fairly safe, um, fairly safe project. I do now a couple more minutes if there are any questions. I think people should be able to um, unmute themselves at this point. Oops. I'm just gonna try and... Uh... I think um, I think that utility, yeah. Here I I noticed this this morning that the uh, photo on Google Earth actually shows the some of the temporary utility spans that had to be put on uh, during construction. I thought I'd just show that. Yeah, over here. So, like you can see here, the uh, at this location um, where the, the cross street would typically go through here, all of the beams had been removed, with the exception of the two that were supporting the soil filled bay, supporting the water line. So, this is the one photo I showed earlier where we had to put an overhead support over this, bypass the water main, so that we could get these out later.
Okay, if there are no questions, uh, the tomorrow's seminar will be on bridge structural design process, philosophy, and unique aspects by Dr. Halim Sata at Ohio University. Uh, if there are no questions, okay, another question is so I'm going to ask what's the extended life service after this? Uh, it was designed for 75 year life cycle. All right, thank you, Thomas. We appreciate your time and everyone. Uh, Absolutely. Thank, uh, we'll thank you for the opportunity. Next. I appreciate it. Thank you. Very good. All right. See you guys tomorrow.